Anything Cricket, Let's Talk is brought to you by Rascals Barbados, My Kind of Beauty, and the Calvary Institute. Welcome to Anything Cricket, Let's Talk, your cricket forum brought to you by Anything Cricket in association with the Caribbean Media Corporation. Today we are broadcasting from Rascal's Restaurant on Brandon's Beach located just off the mighty Griner Highway. We've got many, many guests for you today, a long list of guests, but we like to do things right, so we're starting with the openers. Uh, to my far right fellow Wallace, a former West Indies opener and Timothy Boyce, who has also opened many innings in his, in his day, now known more for his role as a cricket administrator. To my left, Martin Paris, who has also had his days on the cricket field. We'll be joined by Wayne Holder and many others during the course of the evening. Lots to talk about, lots of cricket going on, the A-team in action, the seniors getting ready to take on India and uh, it just goes on and on and on. When we come back, you will hear from the captain of the one day side uh, in the A-team, that's Rostin Chase. And Wayne Holder will be guiding, um, sharing some thoughts and guiding these gentlemen uh, through a discussion on West Indies cricket, on anything cricket, let's talk. Rascals Barbados, let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. Rascals on the mighty Griner Highway. Call 538-9990. Hi Rustin, congratulations on the appointment to the captaincy of the West Indies A team. Um, can you tell me a bit about your cricket grooming and how Combermere and your club and player would have influenced you as a cricketer and now performing international duty? Uh, well, I would say Combermere was a stepping stone for my cricket career. Uh, when I got there, I met Roddy Eswick, and he's been a mentor for me since then. And he's really taught me a lot about the game and improved my game a lot. And having went to Empire, um, I decided to go to Empire because I thought that it would have been a challenge for me to keep a player at Empire. So I thought that would have pushed me to, to, to have some good performances so that I can stay in the team. And those performances I thought would lead me to a Barbados selection and it, and it did. What do you think is your role in the white ball format compared to the red ball? Well, I bat a little earlier in the white ball cricket, I bat at four, but I just think my role is to bat majority of the overs, just um, take the strike over, just keep rotating the strike and hold the innings together really because you know in, in the West Indies setup we have a lot of guys that um, can hit the ball a fair distance, so I just think that I'm um, just one of those guys to just um, facilitate for those um, power players and just for take the strike, as I said, and in the bowling department, just to, to bowl, bowl a couple of overs if needed, or even bowl 10 overs if needed. It's pretty impressive to hear you talk about rotating the strike, as it can be seen as one of the weaknesses of, of our game. Uh, what do you think is the key to perfecting or executing that rotation when things could be a little tight and scoring from good balls? Uh, for me, it is mainly using the depth of the crease and also having a boundary option. I think that once you could have a boundary option and manipulate the field, that makes it easier for you to get singles because you, 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 you actually um, place the field yourself so you, you set the field yourself 
we, we hold you back. So once you can manipulate the ball and have a bone reaction also, it can make life easier for you to, to rotate straight, picking up the ones and twos. How would you describe your captaincy, your style of captaincy? Uh, I'm not very aggressive in terms of my way must work or must go all the time. I'm very open to suggestions, but I think I have a, a good cricket brain, so um, sometimes I just talk with some of the senior guys to get their opinion, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm too firm, but I can be firm at times, but I don't think that I'm too firm. I just, and it depends on, on the player too. If the player is more of an experienced player, I would tend to let them go with, with what they want first before I take things into my own hands. Have you, well, seeing how the series has gone so far, have you picked up on any areas, your personally and team-wise, that you would like to improve? For example, strategies or player management? Uh, I think you could always improve on player management, seeing that uh, we've now come together as a group. I don't really know all the guys the way I would like to know them, so my management is, is a... Um, the way that I could improve, I would say, but I thought that our strategies being good in terms of the bowling department. It's only in this last game that we played, the guys got um, a, a, a hefty score, but I thought for the, the first and the second games, I couldn't really fault the guys in the field or in the bowling department. We, we've been doing um, exceptional in the first two games, but I just think that it's a case where the Bahrain is letting us down, you know, um, getting those totals that we need, those partnerships. We, we just keep losing um, wickets in clusters and the guys are not really um, showing enough fight and putting up their hand and, and being accounted for. Have you given Jason or perhaps Craig a show to ask them for any tips? Uh, no, I've just been learning on the job and working with what I, with who I have here. Um, I've, I've been given a book by a man, so I've just been been reading and learning some, some stuff from that book. But no, I haven't um, contacted Craig or Jason for any tips of that. All right, Rustin. I'm very glad that you took the time out on your off day to have a chat with me. And I wish you all the best in your personal career and as captain. All right, thanks a lot. Gentlemen, we would have heard from Rustin Chase, well, in his capacity as the captain of the West Indies A team in that series against the India A. And um, I'm going to start with you, fellow, uh, about your thoughts on Rustin Chase's elevation to captaincy. We, we haven't seen or known a lot about Roston Chase, the captain uh, coming through uh, the, the various levels of local cricket. And a bold step by the West Indies selectors. Uh, good evening, and thank you for having me on your show. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good, a good move uh, by Cricket West Indies uh, to have Roston Chase captain uh, the West Indies A team in that one day series. Uh, they look at how the, how the senior side perform in the World Cup. Obviously, it was not good very poor performance, poor performances in the World Cup. And we're looking, Cricket West Indies obviously are looking for leaders. The next World Cup, 50 year World Cup, will be four years time. So you're looking to see how best you can find leaders to get into positions where you can say, well, look, here we start to identify guys who are looking to lead. I'm happy for him. The, the series against India A was not as, as fruitful as we would have thought. Uh, they lost 4-1, uh, beat them quite badly. And Roston himself then have a good series with the bat. He got about 87 runs. But I, I hope that he has learned from the whole experience of playing against a very good India A. And conditions that were, I think, were, were quite good for one day cricket. And I hope that he can just go from strength to strength and see himself now as a leader. And obviously, to be a good leader, you also have to follow. But follow in the right directions and the right people and seek advice and just try to get better because there'll be more opportunities for him, I believe.
to leave uh, West Indies 18s in the ODI series. It's not the end of the road for him. And maybe you never know, he might be elevated uh, down the road to, to lead West Indies cricket on this side if he can get you know the performances that are expected of him. Because a lot of people were talking that he should have gone to the World Cup. I believe he should not have gone because you want these young men to develop their skills a lot better. Uh, I think that he is one for the future. He's, he's a good test match cricketer. He's a good four-day cricketer. He just needs to solidify those performances and then obviously transfer all of that into the 50 over cricket. So I think he's on the right path. It's just up to him to, if he's going to grab the opportunities that are provided. Tim Boyce, mm. quite pertinently, Ross and Chase named in the West Indies one day international side uh, for the series against India proper uh, uh, coming up uh, very shortly after the T20s of course and um, do you think though that his that elevation was worthy um, as Phil would have mentioned there was some discussion about Roston being in the team to the World Cup do you think that the selectors have corrected the mistake? I, I, I don't know I don't think we know enough of Ross and Chase as a, as a captain. I wonder if it is not payback time, if the selectors haven't recognized that Ralston should have been at the World Cup, have decided that they're now going to put him into the team and to compensate in terms of making him the captain of the team. We, we will have to look at him performing on the job to see what his capacity is as a captain, but I know for sure that if he had been at that World Cup, I think we'd have had some solidity at the number six. And a guy like Watson Chase, who, who bowled out England, or virtually bowled them out before, and, made, and performed against them so, much, so well down here, I do not think we had a team strong enough to have it, excluded a fellow like Chase from being in the World Cup. But I, I do believe that having given him the chance, he will grab it with both hands. And look, and I, we, the Barbados Cricket, Cricket Administration, must look and see that every time they're looking for leaders, they're looking for someone to take a leadership role, Barbados comes into play. And we have to look and recognize that we have to keep nourishing and producing that kind of player who not only plays the game, but that kind of player who takes the game in as a total game and, and has the ability to, to lead, has the ability to demonstrate that they, 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 we play the game from the shoulders up. Because in that World Cup, I'll tell you the truth, we didn't play from our shoulders up, we played from our shoulders down. Hanai coordination, yes, all of that kind of thing was in place. But you need less than six runs per over to win a game. And about five and six of your batsmen get out hitting, going for sixes and hitting the ball through the air. I, I think we have a lot to learn. But I, in my own view, though, the West Indies cricketers, they're not interested in any other game other than the 20, 2020 game. The guys are playing and making sure that they have their, their what, what you call it, the runway? Up, strike rate. The strike rate up to such an extent that, any, uh, that the franchise around the world would pick them up. They're not interested in staying at the wicket and making, two, making 50 and 60 runs out of 100 balls. And this is what the World Cup needed. You had less than three, 200 runs to make in 300 balls, and you get in four and five, six bats, been getting out. Hetmeyer, I mean, he hit a four, he hit a six, and he's going for another six. You know, and uh, I said before when 2020 started that this is going to be the demise of the West Indies as a test playing country. And it is going to be the same way the 50 over game because the guys are interested in playing four. Bowling four balls, I mean four overs, rather than bowling 20 overs in a, in a test game. Why would I want to bowl 20 overs in a test match and get paid $200,000 when I could bowl four overs in a 2020 game and get a contract for 500000 The maths of it doesn't work in our favor. But why um, us in the West Indies have a completely different experience as far as 2020 is concerned? When we see that the governing body of the sport, the ICC, has been using T20 as a method of spreading the game, um, the game of cricket to the world, the Indians and the Australians and the top teams in the world, they are benefiting by their T20 uh, franchise tournaments. Uh, India producing uh, a plethora 
of outstanding young cricketers and, and not that they have their grounding in the T20 mm -hmm. because they have a very strong first class system set up uh, underneath there but these players come to the fore as far as spreading the knowledge of them to the world through the method of T20 cricket. So why is it that the other territories are using T20 cricket as a means of, of fulfilling the, their or propelling their game? And we in the West Indies are still complaining about it, fellow. Well, because we, have, we don't have the systems in the Caribbean. First of all, we don't have the right personnel in the Caribbean to, to help our youngsters to understand the importance of playing the longer format of cricket. And I think that is where we are falling down in the region. And I'm, I'm going to, to knock the territorial boards because I think that they don't do enough to bring this talent and bring the understanding into, into our, our system here in the Caribbean. Obviously, we, we can't compete monetarily because we don't have the monies that they get. But I think that if we can get our, our young cricketers to understand the importance of playing three-day, four-day and five-day cricket, I think they will have a better grounding. Because you can use a young man like Shubman Gill who exploited the under-19 cricket at the World Cup. He went into the IPL and played for KKR and he got runs. But he's in the Caribbean playing the one-day series for India and he scored the most runs. How can he transition so quickly? So it has to be the systems that, that they have in place, the Indians and the other international uh, countries. And we in the Caribbean, we lack the systems. We don't have the processes and stuff like that to develop our cricketers. And I think the mental aspect as well from our cricketers is, is just being so just being pushed by the wayside because we don't have enough professional people to help these guys think, think about their game and how to, how to diversify their thinking in the various uh, formats of cricket. So I think that we in the Caribbean, we are lacking from policies and systems and personnel to help our cricketers to develop to what we expect them to be, judging from the other international players. You see, but cricket, cricket is a profession in most of these other places. Professionalism has only just started in West Indies cricket. Only just started. And you, you got to understand that these guys don't see cricket as a long-term viable profession. They see it as a short-term measure of earning money. Even though cricket is internationally a professional sport, in the Caribbean it isn't. We still run in the Caribbean. Most of the cricketing bodies in the Caribbean are still run by amateur people. We sit on a board and we work from 5 in the evening to 12 in the night sometimes. And that is all complimentary. And you will find that the, the coaches, and the, they get paid by how? Until we can professionalize and we don't have the, 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 the amount of money, we don't have the, the, the numbers. You talk India, 1.2 billion people. You know, playing playing the game, and you you talk even in New Zealand. Every from the time I understand in third form, I, at New Zealand, if you decide if you look as if you're going to be a cricketer, they put you there, and you decide that cricket is going to be your profession, and you work towards that. And that is happening in most countries in Barbados. Look at the the, the joy for archers and the the guys who left the Caribbean and go to England and play, and look at the approach to the game. It's a completely different approach. You think the press would have followed uh, if Joy Archer was playing for the West Indies, he had gone to England and done that well playing for the West Indies, the press would have followed, followed him wherever he went in such a short period of time. No, we would have to qualify. Maybe don't even follow the guys over. <laughs> From the perspective though, your involvement at the Barbados Cricket Association level, you are part of the administration yes. of our cricket in Barbados. And um, obviously, it is under your responsibility, and I'm just speaking your in yes, a plural way, your responsibility uh, to the development of, of cricket in Barbados. And what would you propose, though, that um, any 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 proposals would you you would have, though, towards how do we get to, to the, that level or start the process of, of like you mentioned, professionalizing our cricket in Barbados. Obviously, may, we may have to start at the semi-professional level. But if, you, if you're doing the same thing over and over for a number of years, you, you don't expect to get a, a completely different result. But well, yes, the, we, the, we accept the that. Bar, bar, in, in Barbados, the, we have to look at our constitution and decide that that constitution has to change in order for us to take the cricket and professionalize it to the point where um, every young man in school understands 
that he, there is a potential for him to play cricket. And that, and that, that must not only be Barbados, it must be throughout the Caribbean. I do believe that the last Best Indies Cricket Board on the Cameron did a fairly good job in the area of professionalization of the cricket in the Caribbean. The continuity of it, a continuity of it has to happen now with that new board. But they, 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 they move from paying 20 and 25 people to paying almost six and 700 people. That's the start. Now the, and then we have the franchise set up in all of the islands. That's another start. What we now have to do <coughs> is to look and analyze what are the requisites for us to move this into at, at the next level. And, and we are conscious of that at the, at, the, at, the, at the board level. And we're doing whatever we have to do to make sure it happens, but it cannot happen just with the board. This must be a, mi a macro effect that involves all the, the governments, the, the administrators of all sport, not only the cricket, but cricket becomes an integral part of the total sport offer that Barbados has. But, and, uh, and it's the most dominant of the sports in the Caribbean. So to get it to that next level, we need, and we have the personnel, we have the fellow Wallaces, the, the, all, we, we have more test cricketers in Barbados per, per square mile than any other country in the world. So we have all the requisites to make it happen, but we have to take it to the next level now with implementation, and that's a very serious word, implementation. It's not easy, it's easy to talk about it. To implement it now calls for a different approach. All right, Marty? Yeah. Um, Philo, first of all, congratulations on your recent selection, because it wasn't an election kind of thing, to a Cricket West Indies Task Force. Task Force. Yeah. How much of a talk shop is that, and how much results can it really and truly bear fruit? I'm just a six o'clock bowler giving you a few trendles. The Cricket West Indies Task Force is a very serious uh, committee in that we have to review the entire systems of Cricket West Indies selection policies particularly. And obviously it is, there were some loopholes in the last uh, selectors uh, panel, the selection panel, there were some loopholes. And the loopholes were starting to get too wide. And obviously we have been called upon now to fill those holes and come with a completely new plan for West Indies cricket moving forward. As you know, there was like one panel that selected all the West Indies squads. So we have to we are tasked now to ask the questions if it is right or wrong. Uh, we've been doing a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. We started here in Barbados. We were in Trinidad. We were in Grenada. You know, we we, do, we did questionnaires and stuff like that online. So a lot of stuff has been happening. A lot of people believe that the task force is not functioning, but it is, and we're up and functioning very well under the, the chairmanship of, of Dr. Shallow, who is vice president. And we, we believe that we're close to conclusion in, in submitting what we have to submit just, just now. Because if we're going to take cricket to the next level, your policies have to go with the next level. Cricket has changed. There's no, way, there's no doubt about it. The, the dynamics of cricket has changed. The dynamics of selecting players have changed. The players themselves have changed. So policies have to change to accommodate all these other changes within cricket. So if you don't change, you'll find yourself getting the same results. And we can see the results already. And the other question I wanted to ask was, we were talking about captaincy, and under your tenure, your successes as a captain, how much of it is actually squeezed out of you like a fresh orange juice as a successful regional captain who went on to the West Indies representation level? A lot of it, actually, because that is one of the, one of the matters as well from coming over this whole task force, uh, the roles of the, the selectors, the roles of the captains and the coaches as well, and who says what and who has the power. And that, that is the thing that we are trying to also establish from our policy. Uh, when I was Barbados captain, I, I, I thought that I did a fairly good job. I thought the selectors, we, uh, we had a very good chairman, Mr. Charles Griffith, who put no pressure at all on any of the selectors. And if there was anything you know, tied up, the captain had the final say, and you felt good as a captain knowing that the selection panel trusted you to make that important decision on which player would you like or what combination would you like. And these are the things that the task force are trying to, to get going because people need responsibility. And I think that when you have responsibility, you can manage it. I think you can perform at your optimum. But the person has to be aware 
of what their function and their roles are so that there'll be no conflict. We have our first question from the floor. A member of the audience has a query, I believe, for you gentlemen. I would say that we in the Caribbean denial. We have not produced an international cricketer, a world class cricketer in, in about 20 years. The stats say that, not me. Um, we like we are still on the eye test. We like, we like the eye test, how it look. Uh, we don't know how really to produce a cricketer. High eye coordination and then go from there. We like the eye test, we will call a man to Carol with an average of 36, but we will not go and leave home to watch somebody like uh, another fellow who scored 50, who averages 50, because that's how we are in the Caribbean. We like the eye testing, and that's where we have found ourselves really far behind. Because you can't tell me that um, if I'm in New Zealand and I have talent, and I'm in the Caribbean and I have talent, talent cannot be the defining factor in who will be great. It has to be more than talent and potential. But we still are at the talent and potential stage. And every year, we talk about rebuilding. After this workout, we can build again with people that are 28. I, I don't understand how we want to progress in this world. If we are going to be rebuilding every time, uh, we have been building since 1995, and we are still rebuilding. Uh, right now, we have, if you look at the stats, the, you can see that the, in test cricket, we have won about 20% of our, 25% of our series in the last 20 years. And 11 was against New Zealand, sorry, against Zimbabwe and Bangladesh. 11 of those series, or those 17 series that we won. And we are still going back and talking about rebuilding and looking at, we, we are in denial. We have to go back and look at a holistic approach, look at every territory, see the system, start from earlier and then build from there. Thanks, Terry. Well, well, before you, you ask your question, Wayne, Tim, you give me a lot of advice in other areas. We'll yes. get past that part. Yes. But in terms of finances and the structure of, for instance, we no longer have a five test series against an Australia or an India. But our players, like Terry suggested, they pass the eye test and they're taken around the world for their various money-making leagues. What's the reason for the monetization and the imbalance of those other people coming back here? Again, and Philo would have benefited from a bit of county cricket, I believe, as well? Yeah, but, but you know, you, you have to, I heard what my friend said, they're relevant to, we haven't produced a world-class cricket in 20 years, but I, I would argue that the requisites for producing that kind of cricketer has changed. A world-class cricketer in the last 20 years meant a guy who could go to the wicket in a five-day test and, and bat long enough to make 200 runs or over 100 runs in a whole day. In the, in, in the new definition of the game in relation to how the West Indian is seeing it, a world-class cricketer is going to have a strike weight. That is a world-class cricketer, a strike weight and a payday that is in excess of what he would have earned playing test cricket and playing, playing test cricket for, for the next five, ten years. And a guy is going to get one IPL contract and what he's going to make for that IPL contract is going to be four or five times what he would make over a four or five year period. So the definition of a world class cricketer in the eyes of those guys who are playing it now is completely changed. Hello. It is strike weight. Fellow, Kian Williamson is a world-class cricketer. He does very well in all formats. Joe Root is a world-class cricketer. He does very well in all formats. And we can go on. David Warner, Steve Smith. Virat Kohli. Well, Virat, the, 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 the number one of number ones. So what makes the West Indian different? Because our administrators are like Timothy boys. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to change. Our mindset has to change. And we have to get it embedded in those young cricketers. And Terry's right. 
we have not produced any world class cricketers because of the mindsets of our cricketers are just for one format. Because the administrators and the coaching staff allow them to think that way. K. Williamson has been playing for New Zealand over a number of years. He came under a guy named Brendan McCallum, who could be more dynamic than him. He tried to transform New Zealand cricket. He went to the 2015 World Cup and they did wonderfully well. They went to the finals and they lost. Brendan McCallum stepped down, K. Williamson stepped in. And it's still the same thing, but he's a lot quieter. But he gets the same out of the guys. He does the same thing, score runs every given day. Is it the mindset? All players' mindsets are bad because of our poor systems and policies and development that is happening in regional cricket. And people who sit on the territorial boards, they are, they are, they're just looking in the mirror and they're not seeing anything. It's blank. And we're being left behind because we don't want to change. Our mindsets have to change. We have to start from the youth. Where's the accountability for these people? That is the problem. There's none. They're accountable to themselves. And that is why the status quo remains the same. And unless we change the status quo, where people are held accountable at the regional level for our cricketers, then we will start producing cricketers. Until that happens, we are going to be spending talk and mud. F fellow, how do you change the status quo? How, when you say change the status you quo? You have to change the mindset of people. Mm -hmm. And you have to start with yourself. You, you have, have to, to start be. with the constitution. Gentlemen, we're going to take a break here. You Just reminding all, this is anything cricket. Let's talk. Coming to you from the Rascals Restaurant on Brandon's Beach along the Mighty Grinder Highway. Rascals Barbados. Let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. Rascals on the Mighty Grinder Highway. Call 538-9990. Welcome back. We now introduce to you Mr. Winston Stafford, a board member of the Barbados Cricket Association, and a young cricketer, a Cody Phillips, who would have come through the local age group system, played at the first division level, and are now playing in the Barbados Cricket League. Good evening, gentlemen. Mr. Stafford, a welcome to the program, Good and evening. to you. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Stafford, we wanted specifically to get uh, from you the programs that the Barbados Cricket Association have put in place as far as the development of youth cricket. And, I, and not only the on-field cricket, we're talking about opportunities uh, for scholarships and, and, and for training outside of the Barbados jurisdiction. You sit on a very important committee. Uh, can you give us some details? Yes, I'm glad you've given me this opportunity to talk about the things that the BCA have been doing for some years without any recognition, and that is to provide scholarships for a number of our young cricketers here in Barbados. We started out really with Dulwich College, and we the, 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 the Jordan, uh, who's now at Sussex, he was Chris there. Jordan. Chris Jordan, Royal Brathwaite, another one of the candidates. Name. Akil Greenwich. These were all boys at, at, at Dulwich College. Anthony Allen. Anthony Allen. I forgot his name. Um, so these are guys that we started embryonically with Dulwich College. And we, we had young people like Cher Hope at St. Bede's in Sussex. Uh, we have a pres at present, we have a young man by the name of Rashawn Boyle, who's playing on the 19th team at the present moment in St. Vincent. He's at St. Bede's at the moment. Uh, for the last five years, we've sent young men to St. Bede, some with more, more success than others, all with an educational achievement at the end of the day, because we tend to tie our cricket to our education. And I think it's very important that we do things like that. We've also sent our boys, we have at present, uh, the two young men should have been at Whitgift School. One is in Barbados, named Young, and um, uh, Niang Reefer. At, uh, the other thing that we've been doing because of the managing migration problem, we've been seeking to find alternatives to the United Kingdom. Uh, we've managed to secure a placement for Joshua Bishop to go to India with um, the Denham's Academy, the Australian Academy in uh, to, they went up to 
Lennon's Academy. Yes, yeah, the Darren Lennon's, Lennon's Academy. Lennon Academy. He was out. He went out to India with that team. He came back and then he went off to Australia. We sent two young men to Australia. In fact. Your, 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 your cousin, Samar, my nephew. Your nephew, Samar mm -hmm. Holder, he went off to Australia. To the same direction. We've also sent uh, Shakim Clark to South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we've been moving boys around, particularly with the pressure on the United Kingdom. Now, we, at the moment, we're looking at a new MOU in relation to Lancashire. Uh, with exchanges from their academy to our centre of excellence, and this will take some time to consolidate. But they, uh, they've been offering their assistance and their expertise to develop cricket in Barbados with a conjunct with education. I think it's very important to make it clear, clear to you that education is a part of what we're doing, because you need discipline to play cricket. I understand that. We, I understand our difficulties, or. Or geography makes it very make it very difficult for us to have any consistency in what we're doing in our cricket planning, because we're uniquely divided by water, and therefore what happens in Barbados will not necessarily happen in in St Lucia or St Vincent because of our stratification and our different cultural behaviour patterns and our different emphasis. I think it, that is important. Now the Lord Governor Award started in 2002. Uh, we've had 21 young men who've uh, won that award. Uh, I think 17 of them have gone on to play at some stage for first-class cricket. So we've had quite a bit of success in that area. Uh, what we haven't done, we've really not established ourselves as, as a successful nation as we ought to be. As for reasons of clarification, though, I just wanted you to name, to name the, the committee that's responsible uh, uh, for for this aspect, uh, the BCA. Oh, yeah. The names are added on every year. Um, it's now called Education, Scholarships and Placements. And you are the chairman of that? Yes, I've been chairman ever since its inception. But uh, I must remind you that we also have two boys at the present moment placed in Lancashire. Uh, Vitaly Wilkinson and, uh, and Demirio Goodman. Oh yeah, from the Barbados from Defense, Defense Force, Force. Program. Now can I say something about the Defence Force? Because it's important that they've been able to provide cricketers for us to keep the doors open in the United Kingdom whilst we are subjected to this very vicious attack on all players moving to the UK to play cricket. If you've played representative cricket in the Caribbean, you're disenfranchised from playing in England. And because a number of young men have left schools with not achieving very much and have gone into the Defence Force, We've been able to secure the continuation of our relationship with Lancashire particularly, so then providing the sorts of scholarship, the sorts of placements that we would have with them. Uh, so, yes, let's, let's switch slightly. You just want to switch to Cody here a minute because yes. he would have benefited from, you would have benefited from an opportunity to go to England. Um, could you get, clarify and, and give us Scotland. a... A little more to Scotland it was that Definitely. you actually went to, right? To Scotland. Um, can you bring us up to how did that uh, come about? Well, basically, um, hi, good night. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me on the show. You're um, welcome. I was currently I was playing a, a cricket game, and you no, know, just nice sunny day, just enjoying myself on the bar. And then when it came out, my coach told me, um, "Well, you'll be a amazing sponsor for you." And I was like. Oh, so then he explained to me that a guy came and he was watching me back and he liked what he saw. So he decided that I was the guy he would choose. And who was he? Um, the guy's name was Harry Dow. And uh, how old were you then? I was about 17. And how long ago was this? Um, 2010 to 2011. And. Um, what did it entail? What did the scholarship entail? Um, basically, um, I went over to Scotland, to Dollar Academy, to do six form. It was a boarding school. And um, at what the name of the school? Dollar Academy. And uh, it said six form, so that would have, two, uh, would have been a two-year course? It was supposed to be, but unfortunately, the documents for me to get my visa didn't come true, so it wasn't able to do fifth and six. So we made it six. And um, how did you consider the you, the benefits that you got out of that, that arrangement? Um, it was an experience. It was my first time actually spending a lengthy time away from home. It took me away 
a bit. But then I just gradually got seasoned into the environment. And so they found the way to get trained and just to explore the environment. I got comfortable. So outside of the cricket side of things, uh, would you recommend though that uh, young Barbadian players uh, seek these, these kinds of opportunities whereby you may not become a professional cricketer, you may not play for the West Indies, but you get that opportunity to first of all broaden your, 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 your scope and also to a, a, an educational opportunity to, to, to get you know, towards qualification uh, as you get into adult life. Yes, I would, yes, I would recommend it because there's not every day you will get a scholarship to go to some place like Scotland. I always used to talk about getting a scholarship when it was small, and then the, when it was actually told I was awarded it, that was like a dream come true. And Scotland is a lovely place, actually one of the cleanest places I've ever seen in all my life. Well, here's where I come in. Apart from the Scottish heritage in some part and my mother's side of the family and Mr Stafford would talk about when MacDougall tied the score and we know of Dougie Brown who represented the England side. Cricket in Scotland? That's a place where they play the bagpipes and stuff like that. Tell me some more. What is the cricket culture like in Scotland? It's actually very good. It's more, I know when people hear cricket in Scotland, they often think a little of it. But I could assure you, I could assure you it's very competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very competitive. Caps and fingers. And the weather? Cold. <laughs> <laughs> and often they'll have like gloomy days, and I'll be at school, sometimes it'll be snowing. I want my hands in my blazer. And the teacher will be like, um, Cody, what? Why is your hand in your pocket? I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm cold. Oh, but it's a lovely day in Scotland. Like, oh, sir, so this is your definition of just a lovely day in Scotland. Just freezing cold all the time. But outside of that, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And what kind of ties you made with, you know, your schoolmates up in Scotland and the teammates for bringing them down here to show them what a really and truly a lovely day is? We weren't, oh, after I left school, it wasn't like a lot of connection afterwards because some of my friends were in UE, so they're focusing on the studies over there and also the time zone differences. But I had at least one friend from the Indy board house, he actually came from Scotland, he actually came to my house to visit me because he decided to um, come from Scotland to see what Barbados was like. And I was also up there at that point in time that Another a girl named by the name of Chelsea, mm -hmm. another Barbadian. Right. So we're still Barbadians at that point in time. Already. And just one question for Mr. Stafford. You gave a beautiful list of what we call graduates of these various scholarships. But what happens beyond the actual scholarship and the. And the uh, you, you know, you've touched a beautiful little subject there. We send these young men away, they come back here with all the enthusiasm, all the thing, and then we don't have any coordination in what go on in terms of our clubs. And I dare say, in our structured cricket, we seem to leave it to drift. You know, we have these young men coming back with all the new experience and enthusiasm but they don't ever seem to clink and pull together. There's no continuation of that developmental strategy that ought to be a part of it. Because our coaches and our clubs are not coordinated with the centre, where our cricket is not coordinated. They go to, I watch them, I make it my business to go to cricket clubs and sit down to watch what the coaches and clubs in the first division and elite clubs are doing with our players. And they sit around in circles and, and everybody come and join in as though you're at a party. There's no professionalism, there's no consistency in the methods that we adopt in terms of developing young people. We spend money, we send them away to do coaching courses and then they're not used. We have a number of people qualified with ECB qualifications that are not in the system. Perhaps, Wayne, that is the mindset that needs to be changed. What I wanted to ask Mr. Stafford, though, he did, you did mention, Mr. Stafford, earlier, that 
the BCA has these programs going mm. and it is not common knowledge. What are you going to be doing though to, to ensure that more people know of these opportunities and what, what liaison is there, let's say, with the schools uh, towards providing, um, the, uh, spreading the word of, of these opportunities that exist in cricket to make cricket as a means of making cricket more attractive to, to, to young people? I think there's been, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's been a plan, a, a new development strategy to, about to be rolled out from the Barbados Cricket Association. I think the delay in rolling this out, I understand, is basically financial, because we're not an island unto ourselves, we're living in an economy that is struggling to survive and therefore to be the equally. I think there's a lot more that can be done to, to get our message into the schools, we have a problem, uh, a structural problem. The role of the National Sports Council, for one, and the role of the Barbados Cricket Association and other sporting activities. What are they doing in conjunct with the Barbados Cricket Association? What is happening in schools who decide I don't want any cricket in my school? I do not have cricket in my school. There's some school, secondary schools in Barbados who are not playing cricket. Are you afraid to name and shame? Well, I, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to name and shame. If your program goes, they will know, and they may come inside. You, please tell me privately when, no, when, but, when we're finished with the show. Know, it's generally schools with low academic achievements, anyhow, that seem not to think that cricket is for them. There is a psychological barrier that exists still in all cricket. I overheard your, your, the captain of the Barbados Air team making a comment why he went to buy all to play cricket. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still a mindset in Barbados about a hangover from colonialism that tells us that some people are still more privileged than others. And it is very difficult to, 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 to rid ourselves of that mindset. If you don't have the goodwill right through the game of cricket, you cannot succeed, particularly with young people. I heard Philo Wallace talking in terms of, 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 of changing attitudes. But the, where we are in Barbados is not where we are in St. Lucia. And I asked the question, who's responsible for being the two together? I would suggest if the, the, those who are ultimately responsible for cricket in the Caribbean can't get it right, we need to look at that to see whether the structure is there right. So yes, we do have the answer to the question. But before we go any further, I want to introduce another question coming, uh, uh, intervention coming from the floor. And our first uh, female uh, First off, I know nothing about cricket, okay? But I'm paying attention to what you're saying. Yes. What's your name? Martin. Martin asked a question of you, but you never answered it. What happens after? What happens after these men leave Scotland, come back to Barbados? What happens then? When these men come back to Barbados, they go back to their clubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they play each club out of the first division and elite. They have coaches that are paid a stipend by the Barbados Cricket Association. They ought to have a normal supervision from the Centre of Excellence. Uh, there ought to be regular reports on progress with these young people. Uh, I think that I noticed Dexter Toppin is somewhere around. He may be able to enlighten you as to what go on in the, in the administration of coaching in Barbados Square. That is not my portfolio. Uh, so why send them away? Why send them away? Uh, that's a very good question because uh -huh. I think there is, and we have benefited by the young men going away. The share hopes have gone away. They've come back better cricketers, but they've been swallowed up into the big amorphous West Indian cricket. So they've made it, they've achieved. So why not do it here? Well, we, we, we got to, you know, we didn't have anything when we had a man and a dog back in 2002. The structure of Barbados cricket has not been really professionally structured until about five years ago. The World Cup brought a, a total change to cricket in Barbados and the structure by which we operated. The 2010 change in leadership with committees working effectively. Prior to that, you had a man and a dog. You, you, had, a, you had a general secretary uh -huh. and 10 and 14 volunteers. Mm -hmm. And? After the World Cup, you looked at the most structural approach. I think in 2016, 2015, you brought in CARICAD to look at your structures, and we're working with those structures at the moment. So it's relatively new what we're attempting to do. Like I said, I know nothing about cricket. I'm just trying to follow the conversation. Cricket, and you completely lost me. Cricket has grown, has grown in the last 15 years in Barbados 
-hmm. beyond recognition in terms I of I remember my dad used to be paying a lot of attention to that. Yes. When I used to live here. Yes. But, like I said, I'm just following the conversation. There was a lot of goodwill. And if Barbadian enthusiasts for cricket can recognize that cricket is still a hybrid, that you need volunteers out there to assist in what we're doing and just not the professionals. And I think this is where we're having our problems in terms of professional growth among our young people. Because we're not using the voluntary services that exist around us because we're depending very much on the professionals. In quotes, those who carry a piece of paper, certificate or qualifications to coach. In a nutshell, cricket is undergoing a trans formation, mm -hmm. whereas in the past it was performance and the talent pool that we had available. It's now being focused on restructuring the administration of it and the same continuity and development that you were asking what happens to these guys who have been on scholarships and been exposed. There is a conscious effort being made. We're trying to thrash out how that is going to be implemented. The word implementation is, is the bugbear. I can explain a little bit more to you a little later on. Can, can I say something more to you? Most of the young men who come back here from having a short stint of four months in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. they invariably end up going to take scholarships at the University of the West Indies. Uh, I may have a bias towards... You know, you know, like, living in New York all my life, right? Yes. And I'm going for a scholarship. I don't have to go nowhere else. But why can't they get the scholarship and work with them while they're here? That's, what, that's what's mind-boggling to me. I mean, maybe my outlook is different. Like I say, I know nothing about your cricket. Well, I, absolutely nothing. We okay. have 160 square miles. We have 160 square miles, 52 cricket clubs, and 21 uh -huh. schools. Uh -huh. Is it a case of resources that well, the, part of it, the yeah. opportunities abroad? Yeah, are, you can't compare to the United States in terms of. Well, no, but we, 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 we're speaking of England. We're, most of our, most of our, um, the scholarships that we speak about and go to the United Kingdom. It's the, the United bond United again Kingdom. to the United Kingdom and, and the friendships that people have developed over the years. Look, Mr. When, when I took over this thing, I, I'm sorry to say this, but. We would just give the guy a television set or a computer, a plaque, and some money, and say thank you for winning the Lord Gavin Award. And I personally felt that it was not enough to do. Uh, and we have gradually developed since 2010. Uh, and the program is growing as you go along. It is, you're restricted by finances. But it is growing. There's a model. If you get everybody singing from the same sheet. But you know, I don't want to say this, but we've got quite a lot of egoistical people around our cricket too who wants to be bought. We've got a lot of bosses. Suffice it to say, it's economies of skill. It's not that the talent pool or the ability, I dare say, to coach anybody to play world-class cricket doesn't exist in the Caribbean, in the West Indies, in Barbados. It's just that the financial structure and support for it is a little bit more easier to attain in the UK, but no, we are quite sense. competent because the West Indies has several multi-layered levels of coaches, etc. When thank you very much for your intervention, ma'am, Mr. Stafford. Um, outside of the playing aspect of the game, the, the physical uh, performance on the field, how cognizant is the BCA about the existence of an industry surrounding cricket? whereby there are opportunities outside of the playing, the, uh, the actual playing of cricket. And I'm talking about officiating and pairing. I'm talking about commentary. I'm talking about um, utilizing technology and, and, and those young people who would have a knack for, for those kind of things. Uh, how cognizant is the, the Barbados Cricket Association towards developing uh, young personnel to, to, to fill these roles? You, you, you've given me a catalog of things, but let me start that I think your daughter is one of the people who benefits by all recognition of uh, people who are young and participating in the media. I mean, she is a, she's an example of, 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 of the cognizance of it. Gary Bell is another recognition of the, of, 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 of the, the care about people other than Quakers. Can I say to you, I recently came back from England and I had some discussions with the personnel at Lancashire County Cricket Club. And one of the things we discussed was to have some of the umpires, scorers, coaches, and possibly media people, communication officers, coming to Barbados to assist us in setting up our own programs. 
Because I think they have a, they have a reason why they want to do it. Uh, as you know, they've been tied up with the Emirates. And I think by developing the, the relationship that we have been developing, they're probably thinking of coming back to the Caribbean. Tied up with that is that they want to have exchanges with what we call our center of excellence and their academy. Mm -hmm. the, uh, tied into that, they also want to give us some, ex some of their expertise in the academy, cricketing academy, which is very professionally organized, mm -hmm. uh, that we could benefit from in our academy. As, and I think we tend to hit a lot of cricket balls and, and mm -hmm. things that we don't go beyond that. Well, let me ask, just let me ask Cody one quick question. Um, what? What role do you see for yourself, even if you didn't make it as an international cricketer? Do you see yourself playing a role in cricket outside of the, the, the actual on the field aspect? You ask me again. Well, no, but I'm just asking if you see a role for yourself outside of playing cricket where you can be uh, involved in cricket at another level. No, it's possible, but currently at this point in time, even if it may not be at Barbados or Westerners team, I still believe there is a way for me to still have an active career overseas on a contractual basis. All right. Beef. Wayne, why have you retired a youngster? We've had a full meal, similar to what you can get here at Rascals. How about a break? Yes, we are going to take a break. We're going to thank these two gentlemen, right. Mr. Stafford and Mr. Phillips, uh, for joining us. And we'll be right back. With anything cricket, let's talk. Rascals Barbados, let us serve you in a relaxed atmosphere with complimentary Wi-Fi or try a takeout meal. Rascals on the Mighty Griner Highway. Call 538-9990. <laughs> For expert tuition, call the Calvary Institute. We offer classes at primary and secondary level. Our adult programs include floral arranging, jewelry making, crochet, knitting, sewing, photography, conversational Spanish, and more. Check out our summer special in video editing. Phone 232-2109. The Calvary Institute in Roman Street. Healing. Nourishing. Restoring. Amazing products, essential to provide healthy skin. My kind of beauty, let it be yours. That's our show. Thanks for watching. Join us again soon for another episode of Anything Cricket, Let's Talk.